Dear Lord, bless the reading and the exposition of the word tonight and give thy people, Lord, their portion of love and joy and peace, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let us bear it. Let us wear it. Let us be a witness to you through these beautiful fruits. We don't need all circumstances to go the way we want them to, to have joy. Our joy is in Jesus. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We give you the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I already gave a title for the sermon to the guys, but I, I changed it because I was right in the middle of the worship and I'm supposed to talk about something else. So go to the book of Psalms 1, please. Psalm 1. And Psalm 2. And I want to just take a few minutes to expound on these two Psalms and show how that they belong together. They are put there in that order by the Holy Spirit. A lot of people don't realize the Psalms is actually five books. Five separate books of songs. Did you know that's divided into five books? Each one uh, put together uh, is in the canon, by the, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. And the first two Psalms go together very strongly. So let me read the first one. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. They're actually like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. <laughs> what, a, what a psalm. What a, you know, the psalms are not only worship. That's, this is wisdom literature here. What wisdom is in this psalm? What a perfect way to start it. Because the subject, I think, is a very serious subject, very important subject, and that is happiness. Happiness is actually serious business. Now, every once in a while, you run across a mixed but guided Christian preacher or something saying, well, God doesn't really want you happy. That's, we're supposed to be this and that and the other. But no, the truth is, you, God does want us to be happy. It's, it's not even sane not to want to be happy. Of course, everyone wants to be happy. Obviously, he's not talking about shallow happiness. But there is a biblical happiness. And he's saying right here in this psalm, right in the first verse of the first, the longest book of the Bible, that happiness is possible. It is possible. And it's very important and it's very serious. And perhaps a biblical uh, definition of happiness can help. Often these definitions help me. What is happiness according to God? Legitimate satisfaction with God and in God. It's like we just read a verse uh, last week from Habakkuk, which is really powerful. He says, look, even if the vineyard's burned to the ground, even if everything's sweet and good and my life is taken away, I'm still going to rejoice in God. We don't base our joy on circumstances. We're not looking for perfect circumstances. Actually, you better not look for, for perfect circumstances to find joy because I'm telling you, everything that can be shaken is being shaken, right? But you know what? We can rejoice. We can praise God. You know, I think of a, a verse in um, Hebrews. Now, I don't even have any notes to go off of, but I'm even going off the text right now. He says, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, you knew that you have in heaven a more enduring uh, inheritance. This is fantastic. Hey, praise God, they just ripped off my chariot. Praise the Lord, I just got kicked out of my house. That's supernatural, okay. And that's not fake either, that's real. I mean, we could, God wants a happy people. And he's going to tell us how to be happy. But you notice that he starts right off telling us negatively how to be happy. Why does he start with the negative? Why didn't he tell us what to do? Because he's assuming you're already on the wrong path. 
right? That's just like the Ten Commandments. I mean, they're mostly negative, right? Why? Because he's calling people that are already really deep, far down the road of murder, adultery, idolatry, adultery, blasphemy, okay? And, and so in his mercy and love, God speaks to us, doesn't he? And he speaks to us, I and thou, thou shalt not, okay? Here is the same thing. He's saying, now look, I want you to be happy, and I know you want to be happy. I really do know you want to be happy. But look, the blessed, happy is the man, but then he gives three negatives. That will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, this is assuming, too, that that's the prevailing counsel, right? And we never lived in a time where there's more counsel. I mean, you could go on the Internet and get 3,000 different opinions on any subject. There's so much counsel abounding, but most of it is totally godless. So if you want to be happy, you got to recognize that. That listening to Dr. Phil or Oprah or whatever is not going to lead to happiness. Often promises to, but it's not. Nor do they stand in the way of sinners. You cannot be happy if you take your stance with sinners. Not there are a lot of people trying to find happiness like, we don't need to have strife and everything. We all need to come together, stand together and find the common ground and everything like that. And that really sounds right, but it's not true. Okay, you cannot be happy if you take your stance with sinners. Like we know a lot of churches and everything like that, trying to appease like Black Lives Matter and all this other garbage. There is no happiness and no peace in that, none whatsoever. And then he says that nor do they sit in the seat of the scornful. And there's a couple of things, and I know that I've pointed this out before, but it always bears repeating, that you can see, like, walk and stand and sit, right? So it's like progressive, really, or degressive, depending on how you look at it. That, like, you start off life walking, but eventually, as you mature, I mean, it's just the way it is, your life hardens into a stance, and then if you're not careful, then at the end, I mean, you're really settled in. You're sitting into a position. And in every case, you know, it's the ungodly. It's the sinners. It's the last stage is the scornful, which means cynical, bitter, unable to believe. And I, don't, I understand that if you, if you listen to the counsel of the ungodly, and stand in the way of sinners, you will end up very cynical, okay? Now this is, this actually describes a university education these days. I mean, the kids are cynical. I mean, they just don't believe anything anymore and they're hostile, they're not happy at all, they're unhappy. And, uh, and, and I see this as, as progressive also in the sense that, um, that as long as you're walking, you can, change your mind. You can take the right or take a left or do a U-turn or a 360 or whatever you want to do as long as you're moving. If you're standing, it's a little bit more difficult, but you could still do it. But it's almost like it's illustrating the, the increasing paralysis of worldliness and sin, where in the end, people are just sitting there. They're stuck, okay, in a sense. And so this is, this is mercy from God. He gives us this beautiful psalm to tell us how to be happy. And now he's going to get positive here. And he says his delight is in the law of the Lord. See, what you delight in is what determines whether or not you're going to be happy. What you really, really like. What you really feed on. And this is the best advice I have ever seen, okay, as far as practical life. This is the epitome of practical advice. Of course, it's the word of God, and it's the opening of the Psalms of God. But look, the best way to be happy is to cultivate a delight in the word of God. And a lot of times people get thrown off by the expression like the law of the Lord. But the law in the biblical thought is not just a set of do's and don'ts. The law is a, an entire teaching, a complete worldview, a way. You see what I'm saying? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law does he meditate every day and every night. 
See, what, people got to watch out what they're thinking about. I mean, I remember one time uh, S Sister Diane Brower gave a really good testimony in church because she said I was driving around listening to, you know, talk radio and politics and all this stuff. And she said one day she felt convicted and she just started listening to Christian music. She said, I couldn't believe how it just changed everything for me, my mood and everything. It blessed her, see, because... Uh, of course, I, I don't. I don't condemn. I, I myself listen to a lot of talk radio and everything. But if you don't watch out, you can fill yourself with such dismal negativity that it just drains your life out of you. Unless you can have a good handle on it, you know. Like we could, we could praise God. I mean, even even with President Biden, I could praise the Lord. But why? We're closer to the end here, and when we could see it, right? And also, the contrast is coming out. I actually believe a lot of people are going to come to the Lord through all this. Okay. But look, you got, you got to make sure that what you fill yourself with is going to determine whether or not you're going to be happy. And, and by the way, you know, let me get back on that subject of happiness. An unhappy person is a burden for everybody else around them. I'm not saying that I would condemn an unhappy person. Of course, I'm a man of compassion, I hope, anyway. But look, we do have a duty to each other to be happy. You should be happy. And you should be happy in a way that just contributes to everybody else. Look, I'm not going to let uh, the, the negativity and death of this world just drain me and drain everyone around me. I'm going to reach out to God. So he says, his delight is in the law, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Now, here you go, and for the sake of my cyber congregation, for everybody here, meditate. There's a demonic version of meditation that comes from Hinduism where it's called mindfulness where the idea is to empty your mind and put it on fix your mind on something not even rational and just fix it until you basically you get to the point where you empty your mind and that is not biblical okay that is not biblical you know what that kind of meditation is like if your life is uh, like a car and your spirit is the driver. Mindlessness is like starting a car in the worst neighborhood in the city and not getting behind the wheel. And let's just see who comes in and takes it. It's, the ro it's one of the roads to demon possession, actually. No, you're not supposed to be empty. This is why many people are very unhappy anyway. They're full of emptiness and vanity. They don't ever think about anything meaningful. I kid you not, the, the word of God is such a treasure. There is so much good things to fix our mind about and roll them around in our thoughts. There are so many awesome promises from God that they transcend everything in this world, seriously. And I know you know it and I know it, but yet we always need to be reminded of it, see? And there is something to even just getting a three by five card and giving yourself a verse every day and go through the day and think about it because the word is transformative. It, it, here's his answer to happiness, you want to be happy. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And there is nothing higher anyway to fix your mind on than the word of God, and, and on God himself and his perfections, attributes, and beauty. This is one thing, what King David uh, gave us a psalm, Psalm 27, where it's like he lives in a whirlwind of strife. He says, my enemies want to kill me. They want to divide me. They want to eat me, he even said. They want to devour me. And it's, it's like he's in this whirlwind. But in the middle, he said, now there's only one thing that I desire. And I'm thinking, what, a bigger shield, a better sword? <laughs> no. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord and behold the beauty of the Lord. It just seems so out of place when I read that psalm, but it's like the eye of a, of a hurricane. There's the peace, see. There's going to be a lot of strife and a lot of trouble, and I wouldn't be a responsible minister if I didn't bring this up. I'm not trying to depress anybody, but I'm telling you something. God is with us. God is with us. I mean, we've got to believe that. It's not rocket science either. I'm not here tonight to give you like some profound, really esoteric thing. God is good, and he promised, I will never leave you or forsake you, and every trial you ever go through, I will be there for you. And now he's going to teach us. This is the teaching of God for your practical life. You want to be happy? 
then cultivate a delight in the word of God. Learn it, love it, crave it, long for it, talk about it, and listen to other people that talk about it. And don't hang around with vanity. Va vanity is a word in the Bible. It just means emptiness, nothing. Okay. Ooh, the Super Bowl is coming. It'll be fun. I might watch it myself. But it's still nothing. It's meaningless. Okay. Uh, how about the promises of God? How about the prophecies? How about Jesus and his life? That is the most beautiful thing you can look at. And you can look at that from now to eternity and get more and more out of it every time. The Gospels never go old. Never. They are living books and they re reveal the Son of God. It's amazing to be a Christian in it. it we, we are blessed. Anyway, let me go on. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Who? The truly happy man. The truly happy man who found the way of happiness is going to be like a tree. But I want you to notice something in this psalm, though, because this verse teaches us about the new birth. The truly happy man is like a tree planted. It's not natural. Like I went out to the ditch one time, I've told you this story before, and saw the most twisted, sick little sp sprig that was, should be a cottonwood, but I mean, it looked like it was half dead and it was twisted. And I actually, I know you're gonna call me crazy. I was in, it was in brackish water too. It stunk, everything around it stunk. I actually felt sorry for the thing, went and got a shovel and a pail and dug it up and put it right out behind my house. I know it's there because three or four times people have hit it with cars, all right? But <laughs> it's been a joy to watch that thing. It's like 35 feet tall. It's still twisted. People say, get rid of it, get rid of it, because the derecho took off half of it. But I still have pity on that tree, even though it's twisted. And I'm thinking, wow, man, he was going to be doomed out there in that ditch. That's it's the story of my life, right? And uh, I was, I'm a twisted twig, right? But Jesus Christ transplanted us into him. And he put us by the river of life. Everyone that thirsts come unto me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's your Holy Spirit that God gives us. God gives us the Holy Spirit, Brother Dave. And he will nourish us. He will give us satisfaction that nothing else could give us, right? And the, all we have to do is drink deeply, learn how to, to drink deeply. He says his, he'll bring forth his fruit in his season. Well, what does God want of humanity? Well, if you listen to the parables of Jesus, it's a recurring theme. It's almost like he's drawing from this. The, the guy put out a fig tree or a vineyard and then he wants the fruit. What fruit? What does God want of us? Well, he wants us to love him. He wants us to repent. He wants us to believe. It's really that simple. Don't let anything ever stop you from that. From loving God. From keeping short accounts and repenting. If you sin, confess your sin. You know what? I will never, ever tire of telling you. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a lost art, the beautiful, sincere confession of sin. Psalm 51 is a beautiful example of that, David's confession. Look, God forgives. And then you can bring forth your fruit and your leaf won't wither. Well, what is your leaf? Well, that's your outward profession. Okay, it, it's what we say we are. I'm a Christian. Well, that's my leaves, right? But if I'm not, if I don't have the fruit, then my leaf withers. And people go, he said he was a Christian, but look at that. See, Jesus looked at a fig tree with leaves and he said, good, I'm hungry. And he went to it and picked up the leaves but found no fruit. And so he cursed it. Let no one eat fruit of you from here on. Now look. It seems strange to us, but fig trees get their uh, fruit first, then the leaves. So if it has leaves, it should have fruit, right? 
This is what he means. Your leaf will not wither. I mean, your outward profession will hold up. <laughs> you, you, everyone will know you are what you say you are. And whatever you do will prosper, which I, that's my idea of the prosperity message, is prospering in God. Whatever I do will prosper. It's not saying I'm going to get rich and famous or good looking. It's just saying, look, you're going to have a, a you're going to have a, a friendships. They're, they're going to be blessed. You're going to have children. You're going to have a life. You're going to have a faith. You're going to share your faith with others. You're going to live, and God will bless what you're doing. Now, that is, to me, the, that's happiness. The answered prayer is happiness. I'm very happy. I'm going to tell you a stupid, uh, what someone might think is a stupid uh, thing, because... Uh, but it's not stupid to me. It's very powerful and beautiful is that I have had severe dental problems for about the last year. And my, I, I, I took it all bravely, but then I got to the point where, oh, I'm just tired of the pain, you know, because I had two pe teeth pulled and then all of a sudden I had this place where there was a tooth that was very, very much pain. And it wouldn't go away weeks and weeks and weeks. And I thought, oh, am I gonna have to lose all my teeth or something? And I kept uh, praying about it and I called the dentist and. And I was really praying and saying, Lord God, I'll do, you get to the point where you go, we got to take care of this no matter what. So I, I asked you all to pray. Everyone prayed. And I went into the dentist and I, he looked at me. And this is the kind of thing, you know how if you get something wrong with your car and then you go into the mechanic and then it, it won't be wrong, it's right. <laughs> and, well, that's what happened to me with my mouth. I said, please check and see what teeth have to be. Do I have some abscesses or is there something wrong here? It was a weird thing because it was where the, where the tooth had been pulled that was hurting very bad. And uh, he looked and looked and looked and he said, I don't know. You don't have an abscess. I don't see anything. I said, well, what, why don't you get out your prod and probe and prob and, you know, because I was almost like, come on, find it, find it, find it. He couldn't find anything. And then as I was leaving, I realized I wasn't even in pain. And then I remembered that on Sunday I had the church pray for me. And God is a God who answers prayer. God is good. God is better than we could fathom and is that not our joy right and I know you you rejoice with me because when we see each other's prayers for each other answered it's just joy the wicked know nothing about this though of course the godless cannot know this look what it says the ungodly are not so they're like the shaft which the wind drives away well, you could, you know, you could be like a tree planted, or you can be like a chef, a worthless husk. They can't do anything with chef, except burn it. You can't build a cabinet out of it. You can't plant it and get something else out. It's dead. You can see big, big piles of chef after a harvest and after winnowing, and but it's worthless. And it's not fixed like a tree. It's just a pile that can be blown about by the winds. See, the wind of this age is blowing very heavily, the spirit of Antichrist. And unfortunately, the ungodly are like the chef. They will conform sooner or later. See, this is the thing that I'm beginning to realize. The, the winds that are blowing now, the only thing that will bring anyone through this successfully is to be rooted in Christ and to have a true Christian faith. I mean a real one. I mean real faith, based on real repentance, real love for God and for fellow man. Uh, like even, even with the uh, thing that happened last March, it will actually start on Easter Sunday, where they all just shut down all the churches. And I felt really bad. I felt sorry, like something like a death of something, a, a death of a feeling and an idea of a good feeling. Man, a lot of people go to church in this town. And I knew, I don't know how I knew, but I knew that when they were able to go back, that most of them, half of them wouldn't go, wouldn't even show up. What happened? The wind blew and the shaft just got moved. Where, where are they? Well, somewhere else. I don't know where. The shaft can be moved around very easily by the winds. You can think, man, that person is rock solid. He is pro-life and he is pro-America uh, and gods and the Second Amendment and everything like that. You cannot believe what you're going to see as these winds blow. 
And as the shaft just gets readjusted here and there, because there's no root, there's nothing solid there. Ungodly aren't like the shaft. Now, by the way, he's still telling us how to be happy. Well, how, what does this have to do with happiness? Why do I have to learn about the ungodly? You cannot be happy unless you've got a real realization of what's actually going on in society, what's going on around you, so you, can, you won't be in the dark. Look, this is the ungodly. They're like the shaft. When the wind blows, they blow. You used to be the shaft, and when the wind blew, you blew. And you can't believe how your own standards have changed over the decades from when you were a little child till now, unless Jesus came in and gave you some rootedness. Because they are like the shaft. Therefore, the ungodly won't stand in the judgment. What does the judgment have to do with being happy? Well, I do believe that this is the controlling thought of this psalm, is happiness. You cannot be happy unless you believe in a final judgment. Now, I'm, I wouldn't wish hell on anyone. I have no desire if someone dies to go to hell. Most shocking and appalling thing that I ever hear someone say is if they look at someone else and go, Go to hell! Oh, God. Do you understand what you're invoking? I wouldn't want anyone to go to hell. But on the other hand, there will be no happiness that's true and lasting. Unless you face up to the idea that this is a moral universe and there is a final judgment and every single account is going to be settled. That's what the psalm says. Ungodly will not stand in the judgment. Sinners won't stand in the congregation of the righteous. No, of course not. One of the things that God showed me one time is that, look, sinners would not want to go to heaven. Of course they don't want to go to hell, but they wouldn't want to go to heaven. Heaven might even be worse than hell for sinners. I'm not talking about imaginary heaven. I'm talking about the real heaven, the holy heaven. People say, I don't like to go to church. Well, what is it about it that you don't like? They wouldn't even know what it is about it they don't like. Too much light? The presence of God? Holy people? Of course they wouldn't want to go to heaven. And that's really terrifying to me. That it could be that the worst day of any sinner's life isn't the day they're thrown into hell. It's the day they're summoned back up to go before the throne of God and give account. That'd be the worst day. They'd be relieved to get away from him. What's it say in Revelation 6? Hide us from the face of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath has come. He says, they won't stand, but the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly, it's going to perish. Now, this is the thing, you know, that's natural to me, is that I have come into a way since I've been saved, and I want that way to continue through me, through my children, through my children's children, through the church, to anyone that I can influence. I would love them to be on that way. And I love the idea that our way will never, ever perish. That eons from now we'll be maybe even reminiscing about this very night. And we'll be going, oh, man, are we glad we made that choice and took that way. But the way of the wicked is on its way out. There's a great poem about Osmandius. Anyone ever heard that poem? This guy came along a desert and he saw the edge of a statue about the size of the Statue of Liberty sticking out. And he realizes that the great king so-and-so put up this big statue and there was a great empire there. And he looks and all it is is just a few pillars, a broken statue and sand and desert. And like the Bible says, you know, ostriches and, and coyotes run in and out among it. What happened to the great empire? Oh, it came under judgment. The way of the wicked are going to perish. The hopes of the wicked are already doomed. Okay. There are, there's already a sentence of death on it. And so um, I want to make a couple points about this before I go to the first few verses of the next psalm. I could go through the whole thing, but I'm, I don't want to keep you here until midnight, all right? The, but the first point I want to make about this first psalm is that notice that when it talks about 
the godly man, he's in the singular, right? It's very specific. He's, he's showing us who the happy man is. The happy man, he tells us what is his thought life, what are his habits, and what motivates him, and the source of his life and joy. He's got a river of life. Like We used to sing a song, I got a river of life flowing out of me, makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. That's a very good song, very happy song. That, but as, with him, it's individual. But with the godless, it's in corporate. <laughs> the godless are like the shaft. Are you talking about any individual, Lord? No, all of them. Why, are you interested in an individual piece of chaff? No. It's irrelevant. It's vain. Well, in this sense, it's doomed. Corporately and individually. It's on the way out. The day, the, the, the way it's set up now, in the big picture, in the Bible, the way the Bible authors and apostles and prophets thought is there's, in humanity, there's only two ages. There's this age and the age to come. And the thing about it is, this age is the age of death and decay. It's, this isn't really our day. I'm waiting for our day. Our day's coming. This is their day. And in fact, specifically, the Lord showed me this a few months ago. This is their hour and the power of darkness is theirs. But it helps me to be happy to know this day is already passing. Now, they might think they're at the zenith. Like, we got the power, and we're going to deal with these Christians, and we're going to deal with these bad people, these self-righteous homophobes and all that. They just think this is it, but they don't realize this age is already passing, and the age to come is already coming. And where are we? We are between the two ages, you see? And this explains some of our dilemma. Some people are sad or dejected or intimidated or anything but you got to realize we're between two ages my problem is that uh, I am a person of tomorrow but it's today right I belong to the age of life righteousness and resurrection and that's the age of death decay and corruption but the two ages overlap and that's why the Bible says something about the church that I think is, it always needs to be reminded. We have the powers of the age to come. That's what it says. We got, in other words, we're the vanguard of tomorrow. The love that's in this room that we have for each other, the prayers, the joy, the glory. Th this is going to be universal tomorrow. The earth's going to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Uh, and, but we're the vanguard. We're the witness to tomorrow. And the other age is already, it's like King Ahab got shot by an arrow in his chariot. And his orders were, prop me up in the chariot. Let him at least think I'm still alive. When really they're already, it's already dead. It's gone. It's bleeding out. Or the other way I always like to look at it is that... Uh, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And he said, come forth, Lazarus. And the next thing you know, in John, Lazarus is standing there in the door, door of the tomb. And that is what I would call an existential moment right there. Because he stands at the door between two worlds, you see. And behind him is everything dead. The dust of death, decay, the stench of death, bodies, bones, shrouds, everything dark is behind him. In front of him is fresh air, the living. And it struck me one day reading the Gospel of John, that's us. I stand here in a door between two worlds. Everything in me, thanks to being born again, wants righteousness. I want life. I want to triumph over my sins. Everything around me, like the grave clothes, <laughs> they kind of trip me up, but there's some powerful principle working in me that shall prevail, right? But in the meantime, we're between two. And that's what Paul told us, um, the sufferings of this present age 
aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall soon be revealed. See, I, I, I'm excited. I want the age to come. I want the day of righteousness to dawn. For I and you belong to that day, not this day that's already decayed. The night is far spent, Paul said. Okay. The, Peter said, the morning star is shining, the day, day is dawning. Look, we're on the edge of something beautiful. But we, let's be happy. But, okay, now look, oh, I told you that these two belong together. So I got to at least give you four more verses and, and show you what I mean. Like, if the man in the Psalms, the, the good part of it, Psalm 1, is very individual. He's not talking about the congregation of the righteous or all that stuff. Not in the first part. Blessed is the man that walks. This is how the man could be happy. If he gets his mind thinking right. If he forsakes the ways that he's already been on. The counsel of the ungodly. The, uh, the, the stance with the sinners. And to sit with the seat of the scorn. If he just forsakes all that, he can be happy. And he can be delivered from the unhappiness that is this world. The depression and sorrow and defeat. If he would just cultivate a holy delight for the word of God. The word of God is so fantastic. It is beautiful and it's something that we should just fill our souls with. That's how to be happy, right? But in Psalm 2, he takes a step back and he's not going to talk about an individual until the end. He's going to talk about Jesus, but it's everyone in the world is in view. <laughs> look, look what he says here. Why do the heathen rage? The heathen is the nations. And if you think about it, the, the, whole, the whole world is in an uproar. The whole world is raging. And I, you, you hear this all the time from me and from others. But, I mean, just think of the situation with Russia. Think of what China is just chomping at the bit to do. Think of the decline of America. Think of the American stance toward Israel, how it's going to change with these bad, bad people. Think of the conflict here in this country. All of the nations of the world are in an absolute rage. And the psalmist asks a good question. Why? Why are the nations? in a rage and it's not a rhetorical question he'll give us an answer but it's a two-part question why do the people imagine a vain thing why are the people of the world once again not an individual a massive group everybody why are they in the grip of a vain imagination which I won't go through tonight but <laughs> the imaginations are many that are vain okay well, I'll, I'll give you one ima vain imagination that's gripping our nation right now. How can anybody be good and promote abortion? <laughs> but but yeah, people have this imagination. Well, other than that one subject, he's a great guy. How could you? How could you give a peace prize to a terror organization like Black Lives Matter? <laughs> we are in bizarro world now. And he's asking, why? Why are they in the heathen rage? And why do people imagine a vain thing? And yet he's not just asking rhetorical questions. The Holy Spirit is just going to give us the answer right in the next verse. Well, here's why the kings of the earth and the rulers have set themselves. They take counsel together. Now listen to this. Against the Lord and against his Christ. Not just against religion. Actually, turns out they're cool with religion. Pope's going to get really popular again, in spite of what an odious person he is. Um, all of the false religions are going to be popular. The only religion that won't be popular is the religion of the Lord and his Christ. So this is your answer? Yeah, he'll, he'll elaborate on it. The first one's about how to be happy. The second one's why everyone else is so unhappy. And one major region, reason. And now this is a technical term in the Bible. That if you watch for it, it gets repeated all the way to the book of Revelation. The kings of the earth and their rulers. In fact, at the climatic scene in Revelation, which is Revelation 19, the terrifying vision of the second coming of Jesus. He gets on his horse with his godly ones. He's going to come back to make war on everything false and evil. I mean absolute war. And guess what steps out behind the shadows? The kings of the earth. 
to resist him. They may as well, because that's what they've been doing all along. And they're, all, they're in many places in the Bible. Someday I'll do a study on that itself. The kings of the earth and the rulers. Now, let, let me elaborate on this, though, because I think there's a really profound understanding that comes from this psalm. In fact, it might be the most important prophecy in the Bible, in my view, as to understanding our times. Right here, this prophecy right here. Why the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And he says it's the, it has to do with the kings of the earth and the rulers. Now, that is a technical term that is not limited to politics or royalty, okay? Yes, there are still some kings on this earth. And yes, uh, there are rulers and there are presidents and there are prime ministers and there are uh, parliamentarians and everything like that. that. They're all in this. Believe me, they are in this. But this is a much wider term. That's the meaning of rulers. The princes are authorities of this world. Now, this would include everybody in what we call, the best American expression for it is, the ruling elite. The opinion shapers and molders, the educators, the, the uh, experts, the media people. Now we see the high-tech people. They're even more powerful than presidents, by the way. These are the kings of the earth. They, they, what they do by their policies is they fight the Lord. They fight his anointed. They cover so heavily for abortion. They resist the people under their rule. They oppress and destroy people that they hate. And they promote some of the most odious people in the land. The, and, and, and not just them, but even like in science, even in medicine, even in law. If you look at each of these disciplines, which at one time in America, they were the envy of the world, they have increasingly been revealed as antichrist. Medicine doesn't heal people. Medicine now champions abortion and the mutilation of children so they can be confused gender-wise. <laughs> That's antichrist. That's evil. Every single one of our institutions, the opinion shaping, educating, movers and shakers and culture makers, that's what he's talking about here. And he said, look, the reason people are in the grip of so many vain imaginations, but one in particular especially, and the reason that the world is in an uproar is these people have this amazing consensus that they've come to they take counsel together against the Lord and his Christ. Now, let's be realistic. Um, there, there's not a hotel in Belgium where they take counsel because there wouldn't be one big enough, right? We are talking hundreds of thousands of people. But they all do seem to have consensus. And I think the Lord showed me what this is. It's the oldest story in the book. Scrimp and save, send a child to university. In the first, year, the first semester, they come home, they're green. They're judging you because you got two garbage bags out by the sidewalk, not one. And the second semester, they're pro-gay. And the third semester, they're uh, completely, uh, basically anti-Christian. And by, if the education is complete by the time they're done, they hate Israel. Kings of the earth and their rulers. And it all comes, of course, in a form of, of course, a liberation movement. Look at verse 3. What do the kings of the earth and the rulers actually counsel? What do they say? And what are they promoting? Well, here it is. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The first question we have to ask is, who is there? Well, you'd have to go back to the previous verse. There happens to be the Lord and his Christ. What are their Hands and cords. Well, a good place to start would be Judeo-Christian morality. Have we not seen a hundred-year liberation movement to break away from the bondage of the Christian view of marriage, sexuality, gender, personal identity, family, the sanctity of life, point by point and block by block, the kings of the earth promote the breaking of these bands and the so-called liberation movement, which is like Peter warned, promising them liberty. They themselves are the slaves of corruption. I'm gonna tell you one thing that Trump was useful for. He exposed a lot of these people in their moral deformity, 
in their complete, obscene personal deformity. For this, they will never forgive him. He was used. Well, but look, this is a thousand years before Christ. And King David is looking right up to our time and saying, you want to know? First, he says, you want to be happy? It's a bad world, hard to be happy. Happiness is elusive. <laughs> For example, happiness could not be found as an end in itself. It's a byproduct of being right with God and loving the word of God. And then he says, <laughs> you want to know what it's going to be like at the very end? Here's what it's going to be like. And are we not living this? Is this not more relevant than 40 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago? The kings of the earth and their rulers literally do gather together. Take their counsel against the Lord and his Christ. Well, this goes on, you know, but I wanted to go this far at least and uh, to show you how these two psalms, they go so well together and they give us so much wisdom about our times. Like, you know, he, he, goes, he goes on to, to speak about um, a piece of real estate, 35 acres in this song. It's called the Holy Hill of Zion. Okay, that's where the temple used to be. And as far as God's concerned, that's where God's name is. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. He, he laughs at these kings and their pretensions. And he says, look, I've got a king that I've selected. Okay. And I put him on my holy hill of Zion. Now, this is funny because even, even in recent history, the kings of the earth through their organization started in 1946, the UN, have determined that that holy hill that he's referring to right here in verse 6 isn't even Jewish, doesn't even belong to the Jews, and never had a Jewish presence there. And this is called UNESCO, and they have, de they have decreed this is a, a Muslim shrine when <laughs> the Quran doesn't even mention Jerusalem by name. But what, what, what's the reason I bring that up, this is a crystal clear example of the kings of the earth asserting themselves directly against the Lord and his Christ. Well, he will, uh, he will uh, the kingdoms of this world will soon become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. But he does give the kings of the earth a very, very good powerful counsel in verse uh, 10, 11, and 12, and then I'll close. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. Yeah, that's what he's saying to Biden. That's what he's saying to Kamala. That's what he's saying to Putin. That's what he's saying to the mullahs in Iran. That's what he's saying to uh, Erdogan. You better shape up. You better get some understanding here. You better worship the true God and kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled for just a little bit. You couldn't deal with it if it was just a little bit. And then he says, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this church. You once told us in Luke, Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let us love you supremely. Let us love each other. Let us gain the wisdom that comes from this passage, which I believe that you took me off my path that I thought I was to take to bring this message tonight. Speak to our souls, Lord. Let us give up all negativity. Let us give up all bitterness, wrath, clamor, resentment, evil speaking. Let us be kind. Let love cover the multitude of all of our sins that we inevitably will sin against each other, sometimes knowing, sometimes not knowing. Father, just give us tender hearts, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's get it.